Hey everyone, I'm Victoria and I'm today's um, moderator uh, for the Globe Builders uh, session. So warm uh, greetings to everyone. Actually, I'm glad that uh, you have joined our amazing Cloud Builders community. Let me introduce Cloud Builders uh, for the who's uh, who are first time here. Cloud Builders is a community for the learning and inspiration. Our online events are headed by the leading industry experts whose Cloud Builders helps cloud practitioners solidify their enthusiasm and better their craft, all while bestowing knowledge. And today we have a pretty packed ag agenda. We will enjoy the speech of, uh, from Rick Kisnach, who is a principal DevOps SRE engineer at Oracle. After that, we will have uh, the five minutes coffee break. Then our intelligence expert, Waldemir uh, Shinkar, will lead a lightning talk. After the talk, we, uh, we're going to have two great fireside chats with Jochen uh, Abilskov and Waldemir Klevko. So, during the chats, we will answer your tricky questions. Don't hesitate to ask them in the Slido app. Because, as we said, the Cloud Builders community is aimed to reach our members with the bits of knowledge. All our events will be in the BYOP format. That means bring your own problems and the Cloud AMA. Ask me anything. So, today's speeches are recording and organizers will send it to your email in a few days. So don't be worried if you missed something, you will have a chance to, to look on them again. We will be glad to see you on our te Telegram channel, chat, links you will find uh, in the description. And for sure, su subscribe to our YouTube channel as well. Okay, are we ready? Drop here in the chat, what do you expect uh, to learn during this build-up? And for today, let me greet our first speaker, Rick Kisnach from the Oracle. Rick is an uh, experienced engineering leader with domain expertise in DevOps, CI, CD, testing, automation, HPC, machine learning, and AI in the cloud. Rick's passion is a building team solving big scale problems. Products he has worked and delivered are kind of uh, Motorola phones, Aeroflex P uh, PXI, Amazon Kindle, AWS AC2 Windows, AWS Workspaces, AWS Load Balancers, Oracle Cloud Bare Metal, and Oracle HPC. And the fan fact, he managed to live and work on the four continents and ended up being in the Seattle. So let me introduce the keynote talk. The name and the title is DevOps in HPC. Rick will share with us insights on how to use Terraform and Ansible to manage big clusters on the cloud. Platform to be used as an example is Oracle Cloud Infrastructure. Write your questions in the Slido app for, for the Rick. And let me welcome the Rick on stage. Hey, Rick. Hey, guys. Thank you for having me. It's a real pleasure and honor to be with you all. Thank you, Victoria, for the great introduction. So I guess the stage is yours, and I'm happy to see you. All right, thank you. All right, let's get the ball rolling, guys. So today I'm going to give a presentation of how we solve a DevOps problem and how we use open source tooling to solve this problem. So without ado, let me give a brief introduction of myself and the agenda. So the agenda will be, I'm going to walk you guys through what's Terraform and Ansible. I guess this is a well-used tool in the industry. I'll walk through an introduction of what is HPC and how it has converged in the industry. And then I will walk you through the problem where we solve in uh, my current employer and which is pretty much applicable to every uh, DevOps HPC community, how we use open source tooling to enable faster HPC cluster creation. And lastly, the most exciting one is the live demo. Yeah. Next slide. All right. So a bit of myself, I, I think Victoria did a great introduction, but let me walk through my background. I've, I've been a principal engineer for more than 10 years in the cloud. Before that, I was in the mobile industry. I am here in a personal capacity. I don't represent Amazon. I don't represent Oracle. I don't represent Google. It's basically on my experience, I was open source tooling for work reason. 
I'm based in Seattle, in, been in Seattle for more than 10 years. Fun fact about me, I love to read. I leave about, I read about two to four books every month. And my favorite programming language is Python. I do dabble with Java and Bash, but I principally use a lot of Python. I do, I do contribute to the open source community for Python APIs. Yep. Yeah. All right, let me lay down some foundation. I'm sure some of you might be familiar with Terraform and Ansible, but let me walk through the fundamentals of it briefly so that we can have a concrete baseline on the how we use this tooling to solve the cluster creation. All right, Terraform is a HashiCorp product. HashiCorp is a company that's based on the West Coast. It sort of, it was pretty innovative when it came out a few years back. It sort of moved the mindset of the industry to code in, to use infrastructure within coding. What it does, it's a functional programming language and it, and it supports a lot of cloud vendors and it is very, very easy to use. And one example I've used shown on the slides are, is how you launch a simple instance, an instance on the cloud, which is Oracle Cloud. As you can see, it's about 25 lines of code. If you can, if you are from the older school, like 10 years back, if you were going to use Java or API, with 10 lines of code would, would actually be about 200 lines of code. And you have to do a lot of homework to make sure that infrastructure is always reflective of your programming language. So Terraform sort of codify it and they provide great support for different vendors. It can be a support on AWS, Azure, Oracle. So we Terraform is one of those, I think, de facto standards for infrastructure along with other vendors like Puppet. So this is the language I've used in my current uh, projects and I, I love it. It's very easy. There's some uh, subtleties you have to get used to it, especially moving from a typical programming language as Python or Java. Ansible. I want to talk about Ansible because the solution I've worked on uses a combination of Terraform and Ansible. Ansible actually is as well an uh, infrastructure programming language, and but it's mostly used for provisioning. And the beauty of Ansible, if you're using it to provision host, it doesn't use any external agent. It uses SSH, and but it sort of encapsulates using some uh, modules that you can do, like example shown on the screen. I'm setting up an HTTP server on different hosts and use SSH and YUM to set it up. Very straightforward, very useful, and Terraform and Ansible work very hand in hand to solve very complicated solutions. All right, let me walk you all through what we've, uh, what is HPC, and then we'll come to the crux of this presentation. Let me sort of lay out the foundation. HPC, it's became very big in the last few years because the in the tech industry was able to process data and in the process, process data faster because of evolution in chipset and CPU, etc. And in the process of processing, processing data, you accumulated a lot of data. And so those data, we the industry had to figure a way to provide more intelligence to the businesses. And HPC has been there since I was in college, like 30 years ago. It was used most in research project in AI, ML, in most of the colleges in the States. It's only recently that the private sector got into it because they realized they can use HPC at a low cost to view trend in big data. For example, Facebook, Google, Amazon, they have a lot of customer information and to get results like, let's say I go on Amazon, I order a baby, uh, I don't know, I order something for my kids. 
books for seven years old. They can use this data to know, okay, they can propose to me more, better uh, prediction of what I need. This is a simple example. Facebook does that a lot, whereby they have a lot of those raw data where they can put intelligence into it and produce reports that business leaders or businesses can use to move their business ahead. So before the big evolution of the cloud, there was what we call the on-premise HPC clusters. So what the HPC cluster means, it's a bunch of hardware that is optimized for high traffic and high low latency, uh, low latency uh, workloads. What has occurred is those on-premises were expensive because of the human capital and the infrastructure capital. Cloud providers use the same concept that on-premises had by implementing the Infini, uh, InfiniBand or Rocky, which are different protocol used, and RDMA NICs, which is special NICs that we use for high workloads. And they created, they moved the on-premises solution to cheaper on-site solution, whereby you can provide customers who want to run huge workloads at a very low cost and at the sometimes better performance you have with on-premises. So this is a domain I've been working on for a couple of years, and I would definitely recommend that you guys have a look at the work paper I've put in the slides, because it gives a good foundation of what is the nuts and bolts of HPC and RDME. All right, this is where I've been working for the last year or so. So this is uh, my employer. What you're seeing in front of you in the diagram is how an RDMA so, uh, HPC solution looks like and how it's provided from OCI. Other vendors in the space, Azure, AWS, have the same concept, but this is the architectural diagram which is publicly available on how the product is being sold. So let's look in the picture, if I can, which I'm highlighting with my mouse. What is it about? So data center is will be me. I'm the customer. What I will do, I would launch a cloud solution where which have all the host provision for me. What that means, I would have access to real-time high-performing nodes that can do RDMA HPC low latency about 300 microseconds for 64 kilobyte packet size, which can, for one terabyte of data, you can process it within half to one hour. And this whole infrastructure is managed and configured by Oracle. So now the problem statement is, how do you provide this provisioning of this complex infrastructure to the customer without going in the nuts and bolts of calling APIs, doing network configuration. That's where the open source solution I'm going to present in the next slide solve this problem. And that will showcase the power of Terraform and Ansible. Other providers have different way of solving this problem, but Oracle is pretty unique in that sense that they provide bare metal and allows you to have full control on how you want your network to be. One thing I would like to bring to your attention of this forum is if you look at the speed of an RDMA network is 100 gigabit per second network card. That means you can have close to line rates of high traffic volumes. All right. So the love triangle, Ansible, Terraform, Cluster. We'll use Terraform to launch the cluster in a bastion. Uh, before I go into detail, why bastion? Most HPC network, they would have a master node, which we call a bastion, and a set of HPC hosts, which will be on different network. Like if you look at this diagram, there's a node on the, it's called the head node. The head node is the master, 
and you'll have a bunch of HPC high high volume, high uh, low latency nodes running in a different network. Why you want to do this is because in most HPC workloads, you have someone who will schedule it using open source solution like Slurm or PBS. And it will say, hey, I'll give you an example. Let's say I have a pro simple program that say Hello World. I want Hello World to be run in my cluster of free nodes. So the bastion will be taking this job and he will send it to HPC1, HPC2, HPC3, and then collect the results back to the bastion. So the bastion by design will be on a public uh, network. The private network will be on a, the HPC nodes will be on a private network. All right, so we're gonna use, we're gonna, the problem we're gonna try to solve is how to set up this design using our solution. So we're going to have Terraform to launch a cluster and a bastion. We're going to use Terraform to set up Ansible roles on the bastion. We're going to use the roles to set up the cluster in the network. And we're going to set up standard packages you might need within your cluster. So the open source solution is in this link. I will, I hopefully you can get the slides after this talk and I'll walk you through the code and we'll do a demo. All right, before let's do a demo. All right, let me get the browser. All right. All right. Okay, I hopefully you can see the console here. Can you guys can you see the console? Yes. All right. What we'll do this is let me start from the beginning so you guys can see where we are so i've logged into the ui that uh, the cloud provider provides i'm going to use the uis to launch a cluster network and i'll walk you through the code all right this stack is just a bunch as a UI for you to input a Terraform script. And the Terraform script, which we're going to be putting is over here. Oops, that came out wrong. So this is a bunch of Terraform scripts and Ansible, which I'll walk you through the logic. So what we're going to do, we're going to input this into the CUI. This UI is just a, it's called Oracle Resource Manager. It's a, Terraform as a service, but basically it's a UI to import Terraform code. So we're going to import the Terraform code, which is over here. I have a zip format. You can have the zip format. It's the same code. Then we're going to go and set it up. This is like Terraform, very straightforward Terraform stuff. Terraform stuff, all right. Give me a minute. I'm going to input the private key. So what I'm doing here, basically, I'm filling up parameters of the Terraform. And I'll just do some basic configuration. This is just, I'm going to choose whatever machine I want to use. With the settings that are pretty straightforward. And then we can have slum or we cannot have slum. Then I said, you run, you create. As you, I'll walk you through this. So this is typical Terraform plan and apply. Plan means, I guess it's like compile the code, but don't run it. Apply means to 
execute it. So let's do an apply. This takes about 20 minutes, about 10 minutes to 15 minutes, because what it does in the background, it provisions the bastion, the master, and it uh, creates the two HPC nodes. Since this takes a while, I did one before. Let me show you how it looks like. So this is one which was completed earlier. Let's have a look at the logs. Those are typical, if some of you have used Terraform before, those are typical Terraform uh, logs output. It, what is done is launch a bastion, it's configured the network, and towards the end, it does a lot of configuration because we install a lot of packages through yum and apt-get. So as you can see, at the end of the, it, how long it took it? About 10 minutes, how long? It started at 12.56. It took about roughly about 15 minutes. It had a created bastion and it created two private networks. So let's have a look how it looks like when it's launched. So I, my expectation, if you go back to the slides, my expectation from this design diagram is actually have a bastion with two clusters. So let's have a look how this looks like. So I should expect by SSHing into the bastion. So right now I'm currently in the bastion and I expect I should be able to log in into two nodes. So let's have a look over here. First node. So from a bastion, I'm able to access two nodes, which was launched from the class from the Terraform file. Let's have a look at the IPs. So there's a there's a couple of a couple of things here I need to bring up. We have what we call the host itself has two NICs. One is with the regular NICs for the regular network stuff to the cloud. This is pretty standard. It allows the cloud to be able to talk to the customer and talk to the cloud services. And the important one for this is what they call what we call the RDME NIC. So there's a bunch of command that you can I can we can show which the vendor provides that shows Boots or Melanox RDME NIC. So what I'm looking for here, what I'm showing to you all is those are RDM Enix. So now let's think about, let's go back to first fundamental. A regular network traffic will be about, for 64 kilobyte, it's about one millisecond. And RDMA traffic should be way, way less than that. So right now what we have, we have two HPC node. And I wanna see how is the traffic like for 64 kilobyte. I'm gonna do a simple test just to showcase that that we were able to set up a network, a cluster of two nodes, which are higher performing. So let's do this. Let's get the IPs. First, we'll do a negative test. Let's ping the regular host, the regular network card, which is this, oops, this has got, the, here it is. So this is a regular network, not the non uh, the non RDMA NIC. So I get about two 
about 100 to 200 milliseconds. Let's try the audio manic. As you can see, here we have about 100 milliseconds for regular traffic. For an RDM unique, you have like 10 times higher late, high, lower latency. All right. EPZ it is to set up a cluster network using Ansible and Terraform. <coughs> Excuse me. Let us walk through the principle of the code because let us recap before I move the code, let's recap what we discussed. So we introduce Terraform as a infrastructure code language. We introduce Ansible as a provisioning language. And I introduce the problem statement whereby we have, we need to configure a high power computing cluster as fast as possible as easy possible. I went for the demonstration, demonstration, <coughs> excuse me, of launching the cluster using Terraform. And I went through the proof that the cluster was able to set up, configure, and ping latency values are correct. All right, uh, let's go for the code. This code is very straightforward. It has a lot of files, but the gist of it is. The Terraform files set up, call the cloud vendor to set up the host, to provision the host. It was a typical, it looks a bit uh, longish, but it's very straightforward. Over here, you set up the network, the cluster network. And you have a bunch of, uh, like, let me go for one example. This one, Basically, when you when you run this code, it set up the bastion with with uh, the volume and the storage. And what it does, the bastion it sets up a bunch of uh, Ansible code that does all the configuration. So let's go through how the configuration the configuration works. So what occurs for this configuration? It it install those uh, agents, it installed the packages, it installed the host file so that you have the nice name HPC1, HPC2, and it set up the RDM in it. The cluster FS. So let's look at one. So this is basically that the main entry of the code. It uses Ansible playbook, which is a way of, of asking the code to execute automation. And it uses what is called the concept of rules. So let's look at one of the rules, for example. So this is the one that's pretty interesting. Uh, what it does, it set up the network card, which is this guy. This is a network configuration which is optimized. So this code basically does that. It it set up the script here. It it do an I F up and I F down. Yeah, and that's pretty much what this is all about. And all this is open source. You can download it, try it. And the good thing is Oracle Cloud Infrastructure has a free tier, so you definitely can try it out. It's uh, well supported. I guess I sort of finished early. I guess we have time for FAQ. If you guys. Yeah. Thanks, Rick. Yeah, uh, it was yeah. interesting. 
demo and actually we do have this, uh, some of the questions and I would love to ask them. And one of yeah. them is actually, uh, when you showed the demo, uh, it was mainly on the UX interface. So is it possible to provision Oracle cloud without using uh, UI console? Like for example, run our Terraform from our ter 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 uh, terminal manually or build some classic pipelines? That's a great question. And the reason I use the UI, it's UI is more intuitive to demonstrate, but we have an amazing, well, we have a well supported open source uh, uh, API that allows mm -hmm. you to talk to this ORM service. This ORM service in a nutshell is just, let me try to draw if I can. Uh, all right, yeah, annotate text. So this is the Terraform file, which, and this is what we call the ORM service, which is a UI. So what I've done for the demo, I've sent this Terraform to the UI, and then it, it in the background, it executed those steps. So there's two options here. You can use Terraform directly from a X term from your terminal as what we normally do. Or the second option is you can use the ORM API SDK and put the Terraform files to do that. And that fits in perfectly for automation <coughs> for a lot of customers. So in this way, you can use the CICD pipelines and don't touch your interface, right? That's exactly what I do actually internally in my team. I use the, I use the, I, I, I wrote a Python, uh, I use the SDK and I use the or, or the Oracle resource manager API. And I've used the internal pipeline for CI CD. So, um, that leads to the second question. So, um, you showed a lot of the Terraform. How do you manage uh, the Terraform repository from the code perspective? Like, do you use modules or, and how do you cover uh, using them? Yeah, let's go through it. It's, those are great questions, by the way. Where did I put that repository? So we've used, let's talk about Terraform, then we'll talk about the, the Ansible. So the Oracle, the Terraform portion, we are using standard HPC, uh, HashiCorp uh, programming uh, standards. We've put all the outputs in an output file and each of the modules explain the service that we want to do. So in a nutshell, let me do this. Let me write this somewhere. Okay. All right, let me walk you through quickly here what we've done. The Terraform, we have outputs. That's the way we structured it. Outputs, variables, resources. And then I think you do have, uh, and you have something called with called scripts. So the variables are stuff that you can change on the fly using the C, using the UI or for the CLI. The resources are stuff you want to bring up on the infrastructure. So let's talk about this guy. This creates an instance pool. It's a bunch of hosts you want to collect together. Configuration does what it does. It configures the pool to have whatever shape or whatever host value you want. Cluster network does that. So output is what you want to see when you execute it and variables or stuff you want to change the fly. So this is pretty standardized hash core way of coding and we will follow the same procedure. So let's say next time you want to add a more resource, you can create one. And what? let me walk through one of the code is this one. So this is pretty straightforward. And all those snippets actually are available on the core website. How you, so basically what I'm doing here, we're creating a cluster network with a with a 
with a specific image with a, on a specific com, uh, region. Let's talk about Ansible. Ansible as well, what we've done, we follow the way Ansible pro provisioned. You have a main entry. Site is what we use our main entry. You have different role. A role specifically does a specific function on what you want on the host. Like for this one, it, dis it disables a firewall on the private network. And the role is using the role configuration for Where is firewall? It's an interesting question. Like while you're on Ansible, uh, how do you deal with the security policies? Like uh, how do you keep updated uh, OS images? And uh, because, it, you know, technically the software update can break the things and it's supposed to be applied everywhere at the same time. Can you repeat that question, Victoria? Yeah, my bad. Uh, how do you uh, deal with the security updates? So, for example, the OS images must be updated, right? Once you get the new security patches. And how do you ensure that the software update is not breaking uh, the things? Is it uh, yeah. supposed to be applied everywhere uh, at the same time? Yeah, that's 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 the, that's a great problem we, we see every time. So I'm going to do a bit of marketing here, even though I'm not talking on behalf of OCI. On Oracle Linux, updates is done for something called Kplice, which applies, which is a way of applying updates to your images dynamically without rebooting it. So let's say as a customer, I've provisioned a host of 200 nodes. And every month, if you're using Oracle Linux, there's a, fu a functionality called Kplice that would allows you through uh, settings to get those updates periodically and without even you rebooting your host. And there's this options in Oracle Cloud that allows you to get updates dynamically. But there's always a possibility that it might break it. Then you might need to reprovision the, the host. But we skip lies and uh, dynamic update of the OS through the OS management service of Oracle, you're able to get into it seamlessly. However, because HPC is supposed to be OS agnostic, we do support other flavors. Uh, we do Oracle does provide other flavors and we do every month releases new pet, new images that supposed to solve some of those fixes. And the downside of it, as I think you sort of got a gist of it, you might have at times to reprovision your whole host unless we do, we, of putting patches to those OS dynamically. So for other OSs, it's it's a it's a bit of a problem. Yeah, isn't that in this case, if you are putting uh, this on dynamically, you will not find out that it's broken until you have rebooted. Well, Oracle Linux is different because when you when we provide those updates for keep lives, it goes through an extensive regression testing on Oracle Cloud, but that doesn't mean you might not have always a possibility, but historically those dynamic updates for Oracle Linux have been pretty stable. We have customers who never rebooted for four or five years, even longer when they're on the key was dynamic updates. Yeah, that's interesting. And I'm, I'm still thinking about the Terraform part, like, um, the example what you showed it's 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 really nice but um what is the best approach to manage uh, terraform for the extremely fast growing uh, project uh, uh, any suggestions it's like, terraform you know, as a service maybe <laughs> yeah <go ahead. laughs> i i knew that you will go there <laughs> yes that's that's yeah. interesting as well and uh, and That's why I that, think we. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, speaking about that as well, like you know, when you define all, everything and configure in Terraform, how do you uh, keep tracking on, like you know, that you don't do the application misconfigurations? How do you bypass the application misconfigurations? Because I mean, the human factor is still in the place, right? Yeah, what with Terraform, what you normally you would do is you will get the state of the of the new of the union, so to speak. 
before you apply any change. So Terraform allows you to, Terraform, this it comes from a part of the HashiCorp uh, package, allows you to know what you're gonna change. And before you change, you need to basically approve it. It has a sort of uh, internal checklist, but then again, it's all, there's bound to be a mistake. If someone sees a change and still applies it, I've seen it in my daily rules, whereby people delete load balances by mistake. But the check and balance exists in the in the programming language using the state files that uh, ex currently exists in the programming language. Yeah, that makes sense, and I I have seen the, that as well. Like uh, still, even uh, mistakes happens. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, I guess uh, I will wrap up and. Um, Thank you for the great presentation and the good, uh, in, uh, exciting, actually very interesting answers. And I, I really enjoyed listening to you and uh, thanks for, for you coming in and spending time with us. Thank you for having me, Victoria. It was a real pleasure to know you guys. Yeah, thanks. Okay. Um, so I hope you have enjoyed uh, the conversation and the talk as well, and uh, leave your opinion in our YouTube chat. Now let's calm down and take a little coffee break. And by the way, while you're on the coffee break, you can enjoy the funny DevOps song during that. Okay, I'll be back. I hope you got the time to get the coffee or tea and you're ready for the new bit of knowledge. So let me introduce the, our next speaker, Volodymyr Shinkar or Voldemort, the one who shall not be named. Voldemir is a DevOps engineering lead at Intellius. With eight years of the development experience, he has successfully migrated, deployed and advised 15 projects in areas of the healthcare, gambling, e-commerce, and the automotive industry, certified safe agile software developer. And now Voldemir will lead our lead, uh, our uh, lighting talk for us. The topic is Argo rollout, live or die, how to do canary for your de deployment. Welcome Voldemir. Thank nice you for a warm you. introduction. Um, I'm really happy to be with you today and presenting this cool tool for releases for Kubernetes releases. I hope you will enjoy, uh, will enjoy it as well with me. Okay. Um, let me start. Um, I hope that you see my presentation and yeah. Thank you for introduction. We, I have my one, but let's keep it move, uh, to here today. I will, I will be, um, showing you the tool that we recently used for our several uh, projects and we successfully integrated it and customer really um, happy with that. And now we are able to test our applications before we release it. And uh, after that, our um, um, downtime rate reduced for several zeros. So we are quite, um, happy about that. And today I'll be sharing my experience with you. First of all, um, we'll be talking today about Argo tools. Here's the four tools that, uh, Argo releases. It's Argo CD, Argo workflows, Argo rollout and Argo events. And today we'll be mostly focusing on Argo rollouts. So Argo rollouts, it's additional customer source definition for, uh, Kubernetes, which helps you to adjust and improve your releases, um, release your helm charts or just simple applications inside your Kubernetes cluster. It supports lots of, um, tools like Istio, um, simple ingress controller or application, uh, ingress controller could be integrated with any tools. And also it supports lots of metric providers. Uh, the, the most famous it's Prometheus, Datadog, New Relic and Wavefront, and also it support custom integrations, etc. How does the controller work? So basically, um, our girl out introduces, um, three additional, um, CRDs. And the most important is rollout basically using this tool, uh, this 
config, you can um, use as a reference existing deployment or uh, describe a deployment inside your rollout. It supports the same keys, the same configuration as simple uh, deployment. As you can see here, you can um, make a reference to workload refer and specify your deployment without um, changing or modifying something. So it's easy to integrate. It's just 10 minutes and you're ready to go. Additionally to your um, rollout, you can create analysis template, which is basically will be using your queries providers like Prometheus or Datadog. You will be able to run a, a queries against it and analyze how your application um, progressing and uh, if there is there any errors or uh, what is response time or even you can check uh, the latency you can do whatever you want um, because you will be having access to your monitoring system and whatever you can get from there you can use in this analysis template um, so let me um, run some demo for you and first I would like to introduce you um, Argo CD is the tool that I, I was using for deploying all the configurations. As you can see here, I have deployed Argo Rollouts as well as Prometheus and the demo application. Let's see what we have here. So basically, it's a simple application which has a deployment. And additionally, I deployed Rollout here. Um, so the configuration here um simple helm chart with a demo uh tool from provided by rollout uh, by the argo um guys and i'm going to change change something since we have argo cd it will be it will trigger this automatically for me so let's change something here for example uh the request and limits because in order to trigger a uh, rolling update or kind of update, we need to change something which is related to deployment. Since all my configurations is available in a code, I'm doing a git commit. And by the way, you can find all the resources, this repository in the internet. Um, I will share this link and you can use and integrate in your system. I have committed change. The Argus D found that this changes and rollout started immediately a new set here with one pod because we have a rules here steps let me show you steps i have specified to set 25 percent for my replicas i have four replicas here so 25 percent is one replica then it has um, stabilization period uh, for a few seconds and um, yeah and after that we have this analysis run this is how it looks in a Argo allows dashboard we can see all the steps here we set 25 percent of weight now we run analysis here's my query it's a simple query it's basically counting the cpu usage because uh, since all the configuration is deployed in my Minikube, I don't have any exporters and I used um, any available metric for me, uh, which is which is available from Prometheus because it doesn't really matter uh, for a demo. You can use wherever you want and count, count any metric you, you, you want to display in your system. Um, I have specified to run it three times each 30 seconds and also we can specify a failure limit for example if this uh, check will fail two times during this execution um, the argo will roll back this pod and will stay with with all with older version as you can see here we have revision 2 so it means that 
it's a new version and you can easily roll back to previous version uh, just by one click which i really like in argo loud also there are a few other features called promote full if we release something for example some uh, hot fix and we don't want to wait while uh, argo loud prom promote all the replicas for example we have 100 yeah and we have tests for one hour then we can promote in one run and it will deploy it immediately as you can see here steps are progressing and we almost on the final stage we also have an application deployed let me open it so it's basically it's demo application which is testing um, the connection yep we successfully deployed the application or not yet yeah we are on 75 percent and after 10 seconds the fourth replica will be deployed after some time um if i'm not mistaken 30 seconds the stabilization period is default value the old replica will be destroyed so let, let's wait for a while the next uh, example um, i will change my query in order to fail the analysis run and then you will be able to see what has happened if analysis run will, uh, will not pass so let me change it here for example change the comparison in this side new usage will not be more than five so we will we will have a fail for this um, release yep as you can see here um the revision two is now active and um, revision one replica set doesn't have any changes here i mean not, uh, any pods so since we have committed changes we will see that this analysis template has updated and the, we have a feature called oh, we, we can't um, retry because previous one was successful let's change something else once again here let's change the same value here And again, version three should be deployed. Revision three as well here, we should see it. Revision three and it's progressing. Other thing, uh, we have five pods here and traffic from outside goes to all five containers which means we are able to test um, a traffic for only a certain amount of people for example 10 percent or something like that we also have a feature is called traffic management we don't have it specified here yet but with that you can manage uh, how many percent we want to uh, go to the specific parts or how many um, to which service we want to to do that we also can separate traffic to to other source i mean to other ingress in not to mix it with real people we can do um, it's pretty agile thing and you can you can configure it to your needs um, we can see the difference what what is going on i mean not difference the status of executions and we can see here that it failed three times in a row and it marked as degraded and the replica of revision three 
was terminated. What we can do in this case? Um, if we roll back the comparison sign, we make sure that our replica, our analysis run will be successful. You will see that this will update it. And then we can ret do retry. We will spawn again the same replica and new analysis run will be created. And once it's successful, the replica three will be deployed to full. Not to full, by, by, by each step as we describe it here. While it's progressing, I will show you the configuration, how it looks like. So we have analysis template. It's really a simple thing. And the, the rest of configuration is here. So it's basically the name of metric that we are using here. We use provider, which is Prometheus, the endpoint to, to it, and the query, and then we run inside it. And we have configurations. The rollout basically has just a strategy here. We specify the canary service, the stable service, the traffic routing, we do have it, and the steps. The steps is basically here. It's pretty simple. You just specify it in a row and it goes through it. All right. It seems like that, oh yeah, it works. Analysis, second analysis run for revision three. This one was successful. And now we deployed second pod, which is basically 50% of our workloads. We can see here, this is a dashboard specifically for our girl outs. And we can see here two analysis runs. One was, first one was failed. And second one was successful because we adjusted it and make just make sure that it will be successful. And this house, the Argo Louds works. I hope you enjoyed and uh, I'm sure that you have some questions and I will be happy to answer it, answer to that questions. Okay, I guess I'm back. I hope you can hear me and just give a thumbs up if you can hear me. Um, it seems we got the, some technical issues. So let's say thank you again for the, uh, Voldemir. And, uh, you can just, uh, ask your questions in the Slido or on the YouTube channel. And I hope that Voldemir is going to answer them, but let's continue. And this is, uh, the best time to say thank you, uh, to the company who actually supported us and made this event happen. Intellius is one of the biggest IT companies in Ukraine, ranked among the best IT employers by Forbes and Dow, And it's not a big surprise, since a human attitude is what Intellius stands for. So you have the opportunity to experience how it is uh, to work for the top-notch IT employer. Please check the details in our chat. And now uh, it's a time for the fireside chat. And we have the first speaker with us on the fireside chat, the first guest, and we are going to focus on automation in DevOps. We are looking forward to your questions. Drop them in the Slido app. Let me introduce Jochen. Jochen is a software engineer uh, at Uber from Denmark. He cares about the software delivery and the people that do it. The key objective of Jochen is to help software engineers build better software faster, while also improving their work environment. Jochen has been working as a continuous delivery and DevOps consultant and trainer since 2015. He excels in Git, Jenkins, Gradle, Atlassian, and all of other tools that help 
facilitate software delivery. And a fun fact, Jochen has spent 10 years in the student community at the Faculty of Science playing the bass in Cabaret. So now we know where that DevOps song came from. Hey, Jochen. Hello, Victoria. Very nice to meet you and thank you for that great introduction. Thanks. It's, it's a pleasure to have you. How are you doing? I'm doing fine. Late, beautiful evening. The kids are not too noisy in the background, so uh, <laughs> it couldn't be better. I just spent uh, some two days in uh, Zurich at uh, DevOps Day Zurich, where I also got to uh, give a, a talk called Automation is Hard and We're Doing It Wrong. So for me, that has been the oh. perfect lead in to talking about automation and DevOps here. Oh, so you gave me a green light to ask you all the dirty uh, problems with the DevOps, right? <laughs> exactly, exactly. Anything goes. That's anything. Okay, yes. But uh, what news you, you can bring us from the DevOps conference? I'm, I'm wondering where the DevOps is going. Like, how do you see it in the future? So we see more and more focus on automation not being something that we strive for because it will give us a competitive advantage but more and more something that if we don't have it and are doing it and are focusing continuously on our automation capabilities then we're uh, lagging behind the pack we're we're not we're losing our edge we're losing our ability to just keep up because we're getting bogged down by all sorts of different things like uh, if we spend too much of our time on deploying stuff rather than using the awesome Argo CD, then we will not spend our time on creating value. Um, and the same goes with, with tests and builds and everything. So like, even though there is in DevOps a ton of focus on the culture and continuous improvement and all these kinds of things, then automation has become more and more something that is a prerequisite and something that you must do and not something that you you can choose to do. It, it has become mandatory and, and permission to play. And even if we look at the state of DevOps reports, we can see even those who are categorized as low and medium performers are automating more and more. Uh, so if you're not good at automation, make sure you become good at automation. It should also be one of the foundations of what we could call professional software engineering and delivery. So at least that's where I see automation coming. So automation is the answer to the old problems. Doesn't it bring any, I mean, doesn't bring its own problems. Oh, automation, like the best thing, way to automate if you can just stop doing something instead, right? Uh, I think it's Peter Drucker, uh, a great management thinker who once said, the, there is nothing so useless as very efficiently doing that which should not have been done at all. And, and I really like that frame of mind because when we think of automation, we often think about automating activities. And what it's all about is creating better outcomes, better customer value and things like that. And we don't do that if we just focus on what are the activities that we have that um, that we could automate or make more efficient. That doesn't necessarily lead to better outcomes depending on, on how we approach it. And simultaneously, all the automation that we have, that's also software. That's also stuff that we need to build and maintain and that we build in all of our biases and stuff in. So when, for instance, we look into automation in the security dev segups, there are probably many things that shouldn't be handled by automation, but that should be handled by education. Uh, and I'm saying that because I think you're like senior architect of DevSecOps or something like that. So you probably have an opinion on that. Uh, yeah, I'm guilty for that. I'm like one of the DevSecOps pr practitioners, so to say. And um, uh, I usually tend to say like, you know, um, automate the security so we have a more time for the education and mm. that kind of the covers what you are saying that not everything should be automated a lot of the things should be clearly educated but um, since you have touched this one i experienced the same issue um, maybe you have seen this in the devops because devops is not only about the automation right it's as well about the processes and the people 
And, you know, when I speak about uh, implementing the security in DevOps, the first and the foremost question I do get is the developers were like, hey, we already need to learn so much if we want to have the full cycle of the DevOps and suddenly we need to um, learn a bit about the infrastructure and how to automate or vice versa than infrastructure people like, oh, we need to develop, we need you know, write scripts. So uh, that leads to the to the question like uh, how to sharp uh, the skills and how to keep up to date uh, with uh, all the recent technology. So uh, how, how do you manage this? Because right now in the previous talk we saw there is another tool for the uh, for the Kubernetes, what you need to learn. And you know, all those tools are coming and all that knowledge. So how do you keep pace? So that is an excellent question and there are so many different ways to unpack that and and think about that i think like the first and extremely boring question is like we probably don't need to everyone be at the forefront of choosing and developing the newest technologies it is okay to let other people figure out what's the most awesome way to do stuff and then just uh, run along when we decide that but I think generally, so so that's one thing like saying we need to perhaps be quite sharp on where we get deep knowledge and where we just keep awareness of what's going on and keeping just awareness of what's going on so we can figure out what to invest more effort into uh, learning. I think that that can help a lot and that will be possible to do on a relatively low low effort. But we can also say that for many things, the key driver for everything is make sure that we have Slack in our calendars, right? The, the more load we are under, the less we will be able to keep up and the less we will be able to be as a team resilient towards variants such as incidents or change of priorities and all sorts of things like the harder we're we're the more busy we are the the less space we have to 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 wiggle and then there's also something because we have this tendency that you also alluded a bit to that we say well we need to be full stack developers we need to have devops teams that are autonomous and have all the skills they need that doesn't necessarily mean that everyone needs to know everything and it doesn't necessarily mean that there are no specialists both inside and outside of the team so in the uh, case of uh, security which i'm uh, not very knowledgeable about but you are so you can tell me if i lie uh, there are tons of things that we can do to let's say shift left on things and we can both have security experts outside of the team trying to enable the development team the devops teams uh, in terms of both uh, coaching and teaching but it might also be in terms of supply and secure processes um, helping with supplying secure libraries if you use these libraries for authentication then you're secure by default uh, to the degree that that statement makes any sense or like if we want to deliver a new feature a larger feature we have discussions with uh, the security experts uh, at the beginning of our iteration and not at the end where it becomes a security gate so in that way we say well we need to be security enabled and security aware but the development team doesn't necessarily need to be security experts. And it's okay that we both have experts and specialists and more uh, rounded just developers, um, at least in my opinion. And it might also be possible, we talk a bit about shifting left, like moving feedback closer and closer to the developer. And that's probably also some of the things that you think about when you say we want to automate some of the security checks so we can spend our time on teaching instead. Uh, but we might also be able to shift things down into our platforms, the platforms that we build on top of. Like if what are the things that we don't have to take care of because that's handled on the platform that we develop to and on. 
So I think that's my thinking, but everything depends on how do you do it. The most important thing is probably that, that you're not too busy to have time for, for anything. Yeah, who cares about the security, right? <laughs> There's a that famous <laughs> sentence. Yes, um, it's not important actually... until it's very important. <laughs> Come on, security is not important. <laughs> um, I'm joking. Um, but they actually you touched a quite important thing, like um, uh, we discussed the DevOps in the sense of uh, having it in-house, right? But sometimes some uh, big organizations, uh, they may get the consultants or they may even outsource. Um, have you seen, how does it work? Can you outsource the full DevOps? Uh, would you outsource it for the 100% somewhere, especially like uh, on the different physical location? So or, that are question, there any successful stories? so I <laughs> think that that is a question that really many people and organizations sit with like pondering how do we do devops and can i some way buy it right that's also always the question how can i obtain this magical devops nirvana that so many people are, are talking about um for me devops is not something that you buy or do or it is more some something that you do so for me DevOps is a part of the way that we develop software. So what people are usually trying to outsource is perhaps their cloud or their infrastructure or their automation or things like that. But for me, DevOps is more broadly the way we work with developing and maintaining software. So as long as we're developing and maintaining software, we can't outsource our DevOps, but we might know. buy our yeah, infrastructure it... somewhere else. Yeah, but um, if, if you stay here, like, for example, if I'm outsourcing uh, all my development team and I do have the product owner inside of the company, and at the same time, I do have outsource team, even another country, technically, uh, you can integrate the, the DevOps culture um, because, I mean, they are developing, right? So you just integrate that in uh, yes. the development process. So at least in my experience and please supply with your own because you have probably also a large uh, contact interface i see more and more of the large organizations that have outsourced their development trying to pull it back in-house um, and i think that's somewhat about the about the conflict about what are the incentive structures what are the uh, silos, What? how do you take ownership of a product where you don't own it and it's outside of the the, the organization even. It's difficult enough if you're in the, inside the seven, same organization but in diff different uh, locations or teams or sub-organizations. But very much of the problematic behaviors that has happened in traditional organizations that has led to the agile and devops revolution comes from having misaligned incentives and if you have outsourced development most likely those that you have outsourced to have misaligned uh, incentives compared to an in-house development team like what is the incentive for a software consultancy that you pay at an hourly rate to uh, improve their software capability such that they spend less hours delivering the same amount of software. Um, so, so it becomes very modeled and we know that incentive shape behavior. So I would be careful about I would at least be very focused on what are the outcomes that we're trying to achieve and are those outcomes better achieved with in-house or outsourced development. And if we're going to be a technology or software first organization, if we're going to be a digital organization in any way, I think that we at least need to have some in-house development capabilities and thus uh, can't outsource our DevOps capabilities. But that's just my opinion. 
Oh, um, to be honest, uh, I would agree. Um, I, I would say I would agree for the hundred percent. And this is what I have seen so far, that um, the companies uh, who try to uh, to implement the DevOps, of course, it always starts with uh, let's do the automation and rewrite everything as an infrastructure as a code, and then they at some point they realize that it's a bit more than just the code. It's as well about the sharing of the responsibility and uh, uh, even at some point transforming the business to become more agile in that sense. And we start to see that the model of the outsourcing may not work as well, like you say, just because the outsource sometimes doesn't buy the company values as an internal team. Uh, but everything as well as always starts with the automation and uh, it's a it's a bit interesting road what uh, I have experienced that um, uh, there are the, some companies who try still keep the balance between um, let's automate everything but still have infrastructure and uh, devs separated. Have you seen this or how does it work? Like, uh, what do you think about that model? So I think. And again, everything I say is opinion and not fact. Um, but I think there we have a choice to make. And it's about how we interface with, um, with the software that we buy. Because I think the only way to buy software is to not have it developed for you, but by subscribing to uh, already existing software. Um, point uh, and case if i buy software it's because i buy uh, a product such as uh, office 365 or something um, or i buy cloud services or something i don't believe that you can say i want to buy a piece of software that i can sell so now you some outsourcing partner need to develop this piece of software for me um, because I believe that uh, software development is inherently a collaborative discipline and tightly coupled to the domain knowledge and organization, uh, re things like Conway's law. Um, and buying a piece of software is the ultimate like waterfall, it's, it's doomed to fail or be delivered so late that it misses the target completely. So I think if you want to buy a piece of software from someone, you're going to uh, outsource uh, the HR part of it and uh, buy access to a development team that you could treat as uh, if it was one of your own development teams but might have some advantages in terms of risk or cost or uh, recruiting, onboarding, uh, some th things. But building a piece of software is a collaborative process. And if you're not going to take 100% part in that collaborative process, you should buy something that is already done, in my opinion. Yeah, it, it reminds me like I have seen this type of uh, what we call as a waterfallish DevOps. It's like, <laughs> but you have the mix of the waterfall and, uh, and the DevOps. And uh, it becomes a bit more complex. Uh, and um, I think um, uh, if you look on uh, success criteria for the DevOps, uh, in your mind, what are the success criteria like uh, for the DevOps? Um, let me give you so, like, uh, yes. Yeah, I I have seen that uh, sometimes the DevOps initiative starts from the from the developers, and sometimes that initiative may come from the uh, top management. So, in your experience, uh, uh, what works the best? I mean, which of the scenario is more successful, or and what are the other factors that leads to DevOps success? So. If we boil DevOps down to some of its original roots, it's about breaking down silos, right? And that means that we should be able to measure our DevOps success in terms of business outcomes. 
and that can be really difficult. And I think the same goes for anything agile and all sorts of things. If we can't measure it in terms of business outcomes, either we don't know how we provide value or we just have a ton of homework to do. So I believe that that DevOps is not a technology transformation, it's a business transformation. And that means that our outcomes should be measured directly in, in business outcomes. One thing, one caveat uh, or thing that we should pay attention to is that if we phrase, frame our DevOps transformations as cost down, like uh, we will do DevOps because it will be cheaper, I think that the DevOps transformation is going to fail um, because it is missing much of the point. And I do believe that we can create uh, value uh, at cheaper for DevOps, but I think that uh, initiatives driven by this cost down will not do the things that will have the highest impact on, on business outcomes or any outcomes really, because then it becomes much more focused on if we spend uh, X hours on deployment and we can uh, automate that, then we uh, can save those hours for something else. Uh, rather than focusing on if it takes 10 minutes to deploy, we can learn much faster. Uh, and, and that will, will become a totally different driver. And I think that belief that DevOps isn't just a cost down initiative that needs to be understood by, by the top management for it to be a success in an organization. But sometimes the only way to do that in the organization is to not ask for permission to do a DevOps transformation, but just start working in a DevOps way until you will just show better business results and those who do not. And then you have like strong armed upper management into buy-in because now you have shown results. Yeah, and, and that actually reminds me, I don't know, have you had the chance to read those famous books like... Uh, the Phoenix project and then uh, the unicorn project came out. So I guess it reflects what you, what you are talking about. Like uh, just, it's better to ask for the forgiveness, right? Than for the permission. So um, I think from your experience. Yeah, go on, sorry. Go yeah. On. So yeah. just to, to like put a tail on that, I think that some engineering organizations or some software engineers, we end up in a situation where we impose more powerlessness on ourselves than we have to. So we ask for permission to write automated tests rather than just saying, this is part of being a, a software engineer. I'm working professionally with building software. So of course I will write automatic tests or I will of course refactor something. And it might on the very, very short run deliver less business value. But in the even medium, short to medium term, it will be much better. So why is it that we always put ourselves in a situation where we ask for permission to do it right? When we as educated, smart professionals know the right way to do something, or at least a right way to do something, why do we then go ask for permission? And, and I think we need to take back that ownership, that accountability for our craftsmanship or our technical excellence, not because it's fun for like purely academical reasons, but because we know through experience, through reading, through community, through everything, that if we do it this way, it will be better. And if we do it this way, it will be worse. And it will not be worse in six months or in three years, it will be worse tomorrow. And we start paying that interest on how technical debt instantly. So, so I think we should do, we, we should really reflect on what is it that we actually can do. And I think we can do more than our intuition tells us. Yeah, uh, I can't, I can't disagree with that statement actually. And, uh, I want to, to stay on this positive note and insp uh, the inspirational note. And I have one tricky question for you. 
As for today, you are the software engineer, right? Any plans to become as an architect? <laughs> um, so I don't really know what an architect does actually. And, but, but I think one of the, one really interesting thing to ponder that I don't have, one thing that I ponder at least uh, at times at night, lying sleepless, is what is actually software architecture and what is it that we're trying to achieve with architecting? And at what levels do we architect in an organization? Because there are small architecture decisions like do we use a first in or last out queue? Uh, how do we structure our code and files, modules, uh, classes, hierarchies, depending on, on on uh, language and then there's more like the architecturing of the integrations like how do we split our domain into software and how do these interact and i think there is much interesting work to be done at all levels and it's probably about choosing the level of abstraction that you feel you can contribute the most to. Um, and I think there's both value in thinking about enterprise architecture, uh, team architecture and all those kind of things and just building better software at the, the low level. Uh, for me personally, what I'm doing is trying to uh, go down a few layers of abstraction these days. I've been a DevOps consultant for some years and now I just built software so that's on a completely different level of abstraction. And, and I think that builds some good skills. Um, but I think that uh, it, it takes just, uh, yeah, interest and, and, and focus. And then again, reading everything Martin Fowler writes and perhaps the book Designing Distributed Systems by Brendan Burns. And then you become a bunch smarter. <laughs> yeah, uh, it's quite important. Like. Mm not to become too siloed like sitting in the ivory tower after the while right because yes. i mean there are so many great architects who came from the engineering side but uh, if you get too far away you can lose the connection back to the engineering and uh, yes um, that's a, at least my observation what i have seen like uh, the, the some architects tend to be too much far away from the uh, the work on, on the field, right? I, I think that the same, you could say the same with uh, security, or you could say the same with testing capabilities, all our infrastructure, all those kinds of things. And if we look at the, the trends these days, I think all those specializations are working more towards going from being a silo of competence to become a coaching role like whether it's coaching about security or architecture or testing it's all about enabling the devops team right uh, and that also lowers the cognitive load on the, the devops teams um, so i i think you really have a strong point like we need to get those who take make the decisions close to the action because that's where the knowledge is to take decisions and that doesn't conflict in my opinion with the need for specializations. Um, and I think one fun way to approach this or powerful way to approach this is uh, with mob or ensemble programming, where you group program, it's like pair program, but in extreme. You group the program together, the entire team on one computer. There are some rules, look them up. There are clever people that can talk about how you do that. And one thing that's excellent about that is both that newcomers to the team, they contribute extremely quickly because they can just participate in this. But you can also from time to time have testers, architects, security people or anything participate naturally in, in the, these mob programming sessions, contributing their specialist knowledge while being a part of the team and being a part of the action. So that's an incredibly strong tool for, for knowledge sharing and productivity. And I, I would say as well uh, for keeping uh, feet on the ground for the people who tend to sit uh, in their own silos and doesn't see what happens in other areas like the development, like you say. 
Yeah, that's a, that's a really good point. And I think uh, that the company should practice with more and more and put some infra security guys <laughs> in the development team sometimes. Yes. Um. So I can <laughs> recommend uh, the lovely Emily Bash. She wrote a book called uh, Technical Agile Coaching uh, with the Salmon Method. Uh, Salmon is Swedish for together, I think. Uh, and she has really focused on like this. There's a missing career path for people who are those who enable other engineers to become better generally. Like. And so if in any way that you're in a position where you enable your team members, your colleagues, someone else, or you would like to be interested in some methods to do that, I really recommend that you you look up uh, Emily Bash and uh, and the Salmon method. Somehow I missed that book. That's a that's a that's a good reference. I'm I'm just writing down for myself, and I'm going to read about that. And so we could have a discussion next time about that book and how does it work <laughs> in our companies. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. And uh, the time flies with you, but unfortunately we need to wrap up and. Uh, it was a pleasure to talk with you and I hope to see you soon again at some occasions and have a more chat with you. Thanks again for coming. Thank you for, for having me. It's been a pleasure. Likewise. Have a nice one. Okay. Um, so um, let's continue with our second guest uh, and we will switch the gears towards slightly different topic from the technologies and a bit more on the human side. So we are going to talk about the remote work and mental health. Prepare your questions. And our second guest is Waldemir Klefkom, solution architect at GitLab. Waldemir is from the Netherlands. He is an IT professional with the 10 plus years of the extensive experience in the software development system, business processes, analysis, and system integration. And his expertise the key expertise are the complex distributed system development, system architecture design, technical problem solving, teamwork, system integration, data processes, uh, workflows, modeling, distributed systems. And uh, some of the fun fact, as always, most probably you have seen him, especially on the avatars and all of the pictures with the short hairs, on, um, but you know how it is, expectation vs reality. Let Vladimir with the long hairs. And isn't that part of the remote working? Hey, Vladimir. Hi, Victoria. Uh, thank you for lengthy introduction. That was a huge list. Uh, actually, like half of that I'm not practicing anymore, right? <laughs> but that's good for CV all the time. Thank you. Yeah. Um, next time I'm going to try to read all your CV and then I guess our fireside side chat is going to be done, right? <laughs> so, uh, yeah, how, how most probably. I'm good. Uh, the sun is shining, which is uh, quite strange for September in Netherlands. Usually it's heavily raining, so it's absolutely fantastic weather, fantastic feelings because it's September, it's warm, plus 27. So enjoying the last, uh, last days of the summer. Yeah, and uh, uh, that uh, that goes quite close uh, to that um, t uh, topic what we want to discuss today. Like for myself, uh, this week was uh, really hectic for me. So I was spending like, you know, from the eight to eight near the computer just because working remotely. And I, to be honest, I couldn't join the sun. And the first thing that comes into my mind, I was like, hey, I'm going to talk with uh, Vladimir and I want to ask him, how do you balance those things like, you know, uh, while you're working remotely, how you don't feel that, hey, I need to finish this one, I need to finish this one, and it's already 10 p.m. How do you balance your uh, life and the remote work? Uh, that's a good one. Uh, that's a very good question, because uh, basically what you have to, um, to figure out for yourself first, uh, if you are working for life or you are living for work, right? This is the fundamental question you have to answer to yourself. Uh, once this is done and you decided that, okay, I work for life, but not the other way around, um, it's becoming easier to make these decisions, right? Because if you feel already tired, it's time to get up uh, and just have a coffee, uh, talk to your children, talk to your partner, talk to your friends, see your friends, 
which is super important, right? Because um, basically uh, working remotely brings uh, another huge problem is um, I would call it dissocialization, right? We, we can touch on that one uh, later, but actually it's about um, your attitude, right? If the attitude is correct, it's very easy to balance. You have to answer this fundamental question, first of all. And of course, yeah, of course, in that in Netherlands, in Netherlands, it's uh, easier because, um, well, especially if you have kids, all the daycares are closed at six, right? So by five o'clock, you want it or not, you have to pick up your kids. So actually, you brought the two questions already in my mind. It's it's like you know, what if I have that. Um answer but i'm still highly responsible person sometimes it's uh it's kind of uh hard to say no uh, especially when the colleagues are asking um so that's that as well like you know some people when you work remotely they tend to to play on these your highly responsibility level so they ask you the questions and you feel like uh, you are forced to get the work done even you have uh, the uh the the the, the children sorry <laughs> i got these in norwegian right now barnehagen uh the the uh the clothes like the children's school closed at 6 p.m but still you need to finalize the work like uh, how do you fight uh, these um, high highly responsible person vs uh, uh, i'm working for the work not like for the life if you see what i mean uh yeah, uh, I, I, I absolutely get your point because uh, this is something uh, I've been used for, right? So I usually, uh, I'm a responsible person. I, I am, I'm doing my work perfectly uh, if I can, um, but I do not allow others to utilize my time because um, basically I made this decision that my time is the most precious thing that I have in my life, right? Um, the all resources on the entire earth you can buy for money except for the time right time is something you cannot buy and basically with uh, with all that thought process that took me a number of years i would say uh, i just started to say no i will look at that tomorrow it's hard it's very hard being super responsible person but you have to make this shift right because um, you have to, to, to love your time because, again, this is something you cannot buy out. You can buy out any kind of resource except of the time. It's crucial to understand this uh, and um, uh, actually the skill of saying no, I will look at that tomorrow, nine o'clock my time, is also precious. Yeah, this is something that I guess I need to learn. <laughs> but uh, uh, It's hard, hand, it's uh... hard. Yeah, I will keep you posted how it goes. <laughs> it's um, um, but once you learn all of that stuff, and um, and as well, like you mentioned, you're a very responsible person, and uh, I was wondering, have you experienced that procrastination part as well? Like, hey, I can do that task maybe tomorrow, and especially maybe at the beginning of your uh, remote working experience. Have you experiences like that you could postpone the tasks and just to procrastinate, open the Facebook, like, yeah, I still have a time to finish it. Let's watch the, some YouTube video or something like that. I, I can 100% relate to that, right? So I, uh, I think that uh, all people in somewhere deep inside are huge procrastinators, right? So I can do that later, I better do it later, or I do that tomorrow, or maybe some other days, like we're starting uh, to go into sports, right? Next Monday. So it's uh, all the same, all the same mechanics, I think. Uh, but uh, basically, I faced that not in the beginning um, of my uh, old remote career, which started back in Kiev in, I think, 2012, uh, if I'm not mistaken. And basically, at that time, yeah, it was not a problem because I was working as a freelancer on an hourly paid basis. So that was <laughs> basically my motivator to... Uh, to do the tasks and so on uh, in time uh, because I was paid per hour. Uh, I actually faced this uh, when I used to be a consultant, 
right? So when you're working from home or you're working from some co-working space and you're not getting this time pressure or customer pressure, um, you keep postponing until this needs to be done, right? Like till the very last moment, like tomorrow is a customer meeting in the evening, late in the evening, you're finalizing all that stuff. And of course you're running into some problems. Um, you have to fix immediately. And yeah, all, all that fun begins basically. Uh, how I came um, uh, to the solution uh, was again, that was a lengthy pro, uh, process. So I work for a number of years uh, full remote already. And uh, I started uh, in the beginning to, uh, to plan my day but um, I always included the time for procrastination into that because you cannot um, throw it away. This is in our human nature. We just need to switch context and this is how we get rest, right? So you cannot program or write some documentation or talk to customers like eight hours in a row. That's just not impossible. You need to take some bit of rests. And for me, um, I would say the savior was uh, power naps. Right, so I was planning my day that until nine till uh, twelve. Uh, this is lunch time here in Netherlands. Uh, I do the majority of the stuff that needs uh, like a heavy lifting stuff. Right, that's according to my plan. From uh, twelve to one, uh, I'm having my lunch and I'm having my power nap. So that's my time. It just actually excluded from all all the schedules. And then um, I have uh, actually uh, the rest of the day also lined out and planned. So I know uh, at every point of time what I'm doing, right? N not minute by minute, of course, but in general, like I need to read this, I need to answer um, to this person, to that person, to that person. I need to have a chat with um, product team and so on and so forth. Right, so uh, it actually narrowed down to, to the correct planning, I would say. So um, sometimes um, we are quite strong in our planning, but there are external uh, situations, like uh, especially now when uh, the COVID came, a lot of the people who were quite fine in the office work and they were forced to come to the remote working. So it wasn't their decision, it was the situation, right? And they were like, okay, highly motivated. I have all the plans, but the physical conditions or the external conditions are not the best ones. Like uh, it's one thing when you have like two rooms in the apartment where you can just lock the room and say, don't uh, contact me while I'm on the work. I'm technically working. But how to deal with uh, this remote working when you got in the situation that you haven't signed up for that, but you forced to do the remote working. And for example, you live uh, uh, with family, with the small children in uh, the one room's apartment or the two room's apartment, but still like, you know, children's, uh, children can come and say like, hey, hey, look at my pictures and uh, look at what I have drawn, you know, all these uh, disturbances. So, um anything what you could um, rely or share as an experience um basically uh, the hardest part to start working remotely um even if you're forced to is basically uh, make this um statement that you actually working right i mean make this statement towards your family because uh, children as well that took me a lot of time and it's still not there because my children keep coming to my meetings uh, to my conversations to customers showing me something and uh, just be easy with that right so it's it's not a problem and it's again use that time for a context switch use this time for relax um because children they actually come to show you something because uh, yeah they, they want your attention and that's that's time well spent i think with your children uh, that's actually bad for work because uh, you're uh, switching the context constantly and um, it makes it hard to finalize your tasks uh, to um, to focus on something especially if you're actually do the coding work um, uh, it's a little bit easier when you're doing like more talkative work like i do right that's a bit easy uh, but if you have to focus uh, you have to uh, to educate them Right, so okay, this is a new reality, and even if you're, if you see me, we are sitting in the same room. 
I'm not here, right? And uh, especially for children, you have to give children time frame because children, uh, they do not understand uncertainty. Like I need to do this, right? They want to uh, that answer for how long? Like um, you can play games with them. Like you give me an hour, okay, then we play for, for 15 minutes, right? Children are easy to manage. Uh, I think that uh, the hardest part for me was to uh, to make this agreement with my partner, right? Because she was seeing me sitting at home. Uh, and again, when um, a developer uh, is at work, uh, you can imagine that probably he is not doing uh, anything or procrastinating anything. Why cannot I just ping him to, to get the trash outside, right? That's a very common thing. Uh, and uh, for me, it was actually helpful, uh, helpful to have that conversation that was pretty hard that, okay, dear, I love you so much, but nine to one o'clock, I'm at work. Even if you see me, I'm not available. Like all the uh, garbage cans and all that stuff just comes after or after I'm finished, like five, six, seven, whatever the timing is, right? Uh, and the other thing is to split uh, is to split working hours because during the COVID we had a hard lockdown here. So we, we had two kids, both working remotely and uh, we had to, uh, to share the time. But again, that goes down to an agreement uh, who is going to do uh, one's job at a certain period of time. And we actually broke it down like day by day. Like uh, Monday, I work in the morning. My wife works um, in the afternoon, right? Uh, and then we do the rest of the work uh, when children go to bed. That was a solution for us, right? Tuesday, it's vice versa, but still we have the time in the evening uh, to finalize our stuff because we still have to work eight hours. So I think it's uh, a lot about making these conversations happening uh, and making sure that your, uh, your family uh, support you in what you're doing. Uh, and they have the, uh, the enough flexibility to support you in what they're doing. But you have to remember that you have to be flexible as well, right? If you're requesting something from anyone, you have to give it back. Like if you ask for flexibility, give it back. Like in that example with children, children need your attention. After, after all, you're either their mother or father. <laughs> Yeah, it's um, sometimes it's easier, like, you know, uh, to have agreement uh, with uh, with uh, the closest one. And, but I was wondering as well, like, uh, uh, for me, remote working is, um, I would say it's quite a new thing. Uh, I'm not uh, so experienced as you. But uh, the, another thing that I feel sometimes is like being disconnected from my colleagues. So how do you, uh, how do you avoid this issue or don't you feel disconnected from uh, from your colleagues while working remotely and uh, how do you keep uh, the team spirit on uh, the, the remote work that's that's a very good question i was referring to it when i was uh, using this term dissocialization which is pretty hard to pronounce, to be honest. Uh, so uh, basically, this is one of the hardest aspects of working uh, fully remote, uh, because you only see people like on a screen, right? You, you cannot make this connection between a person you see on the screen and the real person, because I think that 90% of my colleagues I work with uh, in a GitLab, I have never seen in person, right? From one hand, it's a shame, it disconnects me from them. But from the other hand, um, GitLab has a very well established uh, system of uh, mitigating this. And we have uh, these coffee chats. So basically uh, how it works uh, is the following way. So you find a person, I don't know, on Slack, on a company website, uh, on email, we have a bot that uh, provides the functionality of finding random people and have a coffee chat. Right. So a coffee chat is usually a half an hour meeting where you just drink coffee, talk about everything, you get to know your colleagues and it's not necessarily your team. So it's all across the organization. Right. So if I find like um, a spot in uh, our sales time, right, I can easily drop him a coffee chat and just go and talk to him without mentioning anything about um, anything about uh, work related activities right 
And even though it's on the screen, it actually uh, gives you an opportunity to uh, to get to know more people than you would normally do being in the office. Because now, um, now uh, GitLab is, at, I think, 1,200 uh, people already, if I'm not mistaken, and growing. And I must say that um, I probably talked to half of that, those, right? And the uh, this tooling like coffee chatting helped a lot and i suggest anyone who is um, who is working remotely uh, start practicing that because that gives you an opportunity that you're working not with the robots or pictures you're still working with live people because when you drop on that coffee chat you can ask like how is the weather in well let's say denmark right Oh, it's raining. It's um, nasty. Not not very nice. Like, how are children? Why are you married? Uh, what sports you're going into, and so on and so forth. And sometimes it actually evolves into closer connection, and you start talking to each other on Slack on a daily basis. Then you start uh, probably um, uh, talk to each other on some other messengers, not work related, right? Uh, I actually made some friends from Lithuania um, and uh, from Ireland. Uh, well, because we found common interests. Uh, we, for example, all mountain bikers, right? And we, we can actually drop each other message videos, links to a gear. And that keeps us very connected, even though we don't even work together, right? And we found out this by chance. So uh, it depends uh, if, you, if you really want to talk to people. And if you want to get engaged, uh, there are mechanisms for doing that, even on fully remote uh, work. Yeah, that's a that's an actually very good practice, and um, I can correlate to that because we have pretty similar what we it just called icebreaker. So it just show up and the team is like, hey, this is a new person, let's have a coffee with that person, and you meet, like you say, and you talk about everything, and uh, sometimes you get the uh so big surprises in the positive way like with you at least you learn something new and uh, like you say it is possible to meet more people than comparing with the physical office where you're just limited by the physical location and uh, it, it brings as well the fun fact like um you may communicate with that person for the many months or even year and then suddenly like even you if you communicate on the camera, but then suddenly you get the physical meeting and it's like, oh, yeah, <laughs> I was imagining you slightly different, right? Yeah, I have a very funny story uh, with my hiring manager who hired me and we met uh, be before uh, in the before COVID era. <laughs> uh, we um, met in person and he was like two meters, 20 centimeters tall. Right, I'm 178 or something, so not really short. Uh, but when I saw him, I was like, okay, I did not imagine you that tall. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, that's a, I would say, one of the fun um, sides of the remote working, like when uh, you get this imagination vs reality. But um, still, if uh, I won't get back, uh, if I won't go back to the, uh, the sum of the problems, um, how do you disconnect? Like, uh, how do you, I, I, I don't mean physically, like, you know, sometimes it's enough just to switch up the computer and just go and do the sport activity or the hobbies. But, um, how do you disconnect your mind? Like, you know, when your brain still are in the work mode where you go to sleep and there's, you still processing, are there any tricks what you are using? Just completely shift your mind from the work uh music well for me for me it was a great answer i used to play music for quite a long period of time i graduated from a musical school back uh back in school so that was quite a while ago and i'm just getting back into music so i i started again to to play the instrument i bought another instrument uh, I started to play bass guitar because I just like the sound. Uh, and that actually makes me disconnected uh, pretty well because uh, this is something new. This is absolutely um, unrelated to my day-to-day -day activities, not related to, uh, to, to technology aspects, so to say. 
to a certain extent. I mean, it's still technology aspect in uh, electric bus playing, for example, with all these, you know, electric circuits uh, and uh, effects, how uh, how they transform the, the sound of the guitar because of the transformation of the sound waves. This is like totally different domain for me. And this is how I, I'm getting out of my day-to-day -day activities like at all, right? And that's, uh, for me, it, it comes super health, uh, helpful because um, uh, having a rest does not necessarily mean you have to just lay down on the sofa and just do nothing. That's also a very nice skill from some time, uh, uh, sometimes I'm practicing it. Uh, but for me, um, it's actually just a context switch, which makes me rest. And this is my context switch. So I have my bass guitar just standing right behind me together with my bike and all that stuff. So like if I'm uh, feeling that I'm okay, I'm just reaching that threshold when I'm just losing the traction on the focus, I just switch the context immediately, either to guitar or I do some uh, very short bike ride. Uh, just to free up my mind. And this is how I, I do disconnect. And this is this is awesome thing to do that through uh, music, through sports, uh, through something that is, um, I would say through something that is not known to you. Any kind of activities, even if you read Wikipedia on the history of Iceland of 11th century, perfect. I mean, if that helps, and this is something that is interesting for you, that's absolutely fantastic. I mean, everyone has this thing. It's just a matter matter of discovery that thing that disconnects you and takes you all. Because it's, uh, I think that one of the conditions uh, to make this happen, it should be super interesting to you, right? This this is my take on on this particular problem. That's a good one. So, you know, uh, that's a really good conversation and we we could go deep dive and um but the time flies and i would like to wrap up uh, and for the final i have the question for you like uh, what are the top advices like two or three maybe what you could give for the people who just starting uh, with the remote uh, working experience so how not go crazy and like you know keep all the life balance work-life balance so what are the top three things what you would suggest? Uh, right. So number one, um, keep your rituals, right? When you were going to office, you used to have some sort of rituals. You woke up, uh, you brush your teeth, you had a cup of coffee, uh, then you probably uh, walked into the office or you drove a car, right? Just keep them. Right, if you, because that prepares you for, uh, for that shift that, okay, now I start working. Right, that that's the number one. Uh, the same, um, the same like one point A. Uh, do the same when you have to wrap up. Right, all the same way you are uh, doing in the office. Okay, five o'clock, six o'clock, or whatever the time you uh, you are supposed to end your work day. Just do the same retail. Just close down the laptop and just walk away. Right, you're done for for the day. Right, this is the the first one. Uh, the second one, if possible, um, make um, make yourself an untouchable area, right? Even if it's an artificial wall made of anything, right? You should have an area to hide and focus. Even if you're living in a one-room apartment, uh, it's still possible to, to have this physical uh, distinguishment be between uh, work zone, right? and um, uh free time zone right so uh what i'm saying is uh you should only work in one place you shouldn't work on your table on your sofa on your kitchen in, in your toilet should you like to right it should be very well defined place where you work and where you spend the rest of your time uh that helps a lot to again to switch this context like when you reach out to that place okay i'm at work when you stand up and for example i have a couple of stairs when i go down i'm not at work even if it's the middle of uh, my work day right so uh it's uh, absolutely uh, useful to have this distinguishment because it helps uh, helps to switch the context 
And probably the third one, uh, well, take it easy. I mean, uh, nobody is going to die if you are going to finish tomorrow. And this is the most important thing. Um, say no if you have other plans or if you want some time for yourself or if you feel tired, nobody is going to die because of your no. Your company is not going to collapse at all. I think that the company is going to um, to be at very disadvantaged position if you're burning out because working remote, it's it's becoming a real problem, right? Just take care of yourself. Yeah, and um, I would say like as well, if your company doesn't have uh, these coffee chats or the icebreakers, uh, implement them. So you you still keep connected with your colleagues, right? Um, Absolutely. Uh, would you get and back maybe to the, get, oh, yeah. Go on. Uh, get yeah, to know your neighbors, right? Because uh, uh, especially especially in apartment buildings, you have so many people around you. Just get to know them because during the lockdown, I got to know all the neighbors I'm living <laughs> with. And it was also super fun because now I, I'm more disconnected at work because of the remote work, but I know all my surroundings. I know people around me. And this is also awesome. Yeah. Uh, in my case, my closest neighbor is uh, around the one kilometer from here, but... <laughs> I guess it's easier to connect with my customers or the colleagues. Um, the question, would you go back to the office life? Uh, never again. If I have to choose jobless or office, jobless. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I hope it's not, uh, you, you're not going to have this type of the choice. And on this positive note, uh, let's wrap up the session and uh, Vladimir. Uh, it was a really interesting topic, and I think a lot of the people can correlate and to that. And I hope some of them have found the answers, especially on the work-life balance or how to get uh, not disconnected with the colleagues and all other things. So thank you, Vladimir, for your time. It was a pleasure. Thanks for having me here. And I really hope that it, my, my story will just help to figure out uh, the new way of living, basically. Thanks. See ya. Th thank you. Bye-bye. Okay. I hope you have enjoyed uh, that uh, the last conversation. And uh, we are finalizing our just another build-up. Thanks to all attendees, organizers, and Intellias for your participation and uh, for the joining our Cloud Builders community. Also, we want to know your feedback. So here is a link in the chat where you can share your experience. So our next build-up will be better and more useful for you. Stay tuned and see you soon, Cloud Builders.